And now, please welcome Steve Boyer, Senior Vice President of Hill and Knowlton, here to introduce today's distinguished speaker. Thank you, John. You know, sometimes the planets just lined up, and I guess I think it's hosts the planets that might be the theme for this particular talk. It even with a a forum that is as prominent as ours to have someone as distinguished as Secretary Norman Mineta talk to us about transportation, which is a topic that couldn't be more timely and important as I think a remarkable opportunity. Um, if we needed any reminder, last week's collapse of the 35W Bridge in Minneapolis should have told us all in the most graphic terms that the Alaskan Way Viaduct and the 520 Bridge aren't just about political battles. They are about sustaining our mobility, our economy, and in the end, unfortunately, about saving lives, too. There is no one more qualified uh, in this country, I think, to talk about transportation than Norm, and I'm, of course, not the least bit influenced in saying that by the fact that he's my colleague and vice chairman of our firm, Hill & Knowlton, which all know as Rocky Hill and Knowlton here in the Northwest, and of course not the least bit influenced by the fact that we're both in public relations. Uh, his accomplishments just simply speak for themselves. A lot of those are preceded by words like first, longest, only, things like that. U.S. Secretary of Transportation from 2001 to 2006, that's longer than anyone else since the position was established in 1967. He was the only Democrat in President Bush's cabinet. After 9-11, he oversaw the creation of the Transportation Security Administration, and with 65,000 employees, that was the largest mobilization of a new federal agency since World War II. There's also a string of firsts, first Asian American, American mayor of a major U.S. city, San Jose, California, first Asian American cabinet member, Secretary of Commerce under President Clinton, first cabinet member to move directly from a Democratic cabinet to a Republican cabinet when he became Transportation Secretary under President Bush. Many awards, two most prominent probably in the Presidential Medal of Freedom, our nation's highest honor, and the Wright Brothers Memorial Trophy for significant public service to U.S. aviation. Along the way, he found time to serve 21 years in the U.S. House of Representatives. And interestingly enough, there he was able to collaborate with an old, old friend from childhood, Senator Alan Simpson of Wyoming. And they didn't meet at your ordinary Boy Scout camp, though they did meet at a Boy Scout camp. This was during World War II. Senator Simpson's troop, because the camp was in Wyoming, used to visit Norm's at the internment camp for Japanese Americans where Norm's family was detained during the war. He has had a long and distinguished journey. And Norm, thank you for making Seattle Rotary one of your stops yet again as he was here in 2000. Ladies and gentlemen, Norm Mineta. Steve, uh, thank you very much for your very kind and generous uh, introduction. But more importantly, thank you very much for your work here on, uh, on the Rotary, uh, in the Rotary Club, as well as your outstanding work at uh, Hill & Knowlton as a senior vice president. After hearing that introduction, I was thinking, where are your kids when you want them to hear something good about you? <laughs> And thanks to all of you for a very warm uh, welcome. Uh, President Iverson, after watching you uh, 
operate here on that amendment. Um, <laughs> Speaker Iverson, how would that be? But in any event, with that kind of skill, uh, we could use your uh, work in uh, Washington, D.C. For me, it is a real great pleasure to have this uh, opportunity to be with all of you this afternoon, uh, and especially to be at a Rotary Club. I was a member of our San Jose Rotary Club. I'm a proud uh, Paul uh, Harris fellow, and uh, so um, I really am proud to be here at the world's uh, finest at Rotary Club, Seattle number four. Uh, and I say that with no disrespect to my own club in uh, San Jose. Now the last time I was here was in September of 2000. And the world was different in many ways. I was then the Secretary of Commerce for uh, President uh, Clinton. And I came here accompanied by a colleague of mine uh, when uh, he was the Speaker of the House of Representatives and was then the Ambassador to Japan, Tom Foley. Today I come to you as a private citizen after having spent close to six years as the Secretary of Transportation under President George W. Bush. And today I'm accompanied um, by Steve Boyer, our senior vice president. You've already been introduced to Randy Pebble, our <clears throat> general manager for the Northwest uh, region, and by a number of our colleagues from our um, office here in Hill and Knowlton. And I'm really honored to meet uh, Jay uh, uh, for, uh, from our, uh, or again, from our predecessor organization, uh, uh, Rocky Doom. Um, since leaving the President's Cabinet, as you can imagine, I've had to come with a few, uh, ha have had to come to grips with a few changes of my own. Um, going first from the public sector to the private sector, all of you understand that you have to monetize your time and effort, and I'm trying to learn that as much as I can. There are other changes. Uh, including um, no more advanced people, uh, no more security agents, uh, no more uh, dark uh, uh, black sedan with the tinted, dark tinted windows and the red and blue flashing lights. Uh, this year I found out that when I wanted to get tickets for the State of the Union address, I got lousy seats. <laughs> and. Um, now when I want to see Air Force One, I've got to rent the movie. <laughs> but I think the best description about leaving the President's Cabinet was given by my wonderful friend Colin Powell. And he said, and I quote, you, you know you're no longer in the President's Cabinet when you get in the back seat of the car and the car doesn't move, unquote. <laughs> Now, while much has changed since that last visit with you, uh, much has not, particularly in the challenges that we face in the topic that I'd like to discuss today, transportation. Um, in terms of um, today's travel, coming into the Seattle-Tacoma Airport, I couldn't help but think uh, back to uh, when I spoke here in 2000, and um, Gina Marie Lindsay was then the port director here, and she was working on the third runway for that airport <laughs> on a project that I first, first heard about when I was in Congress on the Public Works and Transportation Committee, chairing the subcommittee on aviation. And then in the early 90s, as the chairman of the full committee on public works and transportation, I was hearing about the third runway. And as I looked at the construction equipment and all that's going on as we were landing, it struck me that the third runway is still not yet completed. Closer, yes, but not quite done. So congratulations will certainly be in order 
for my very good friend, your new uh, CEO at the Port of S Seattle, Tei Yoshitani, who is here today, and uh, his uh, daughter, Jennifer, who um, uh, is visiting uh, from uh, Maryland right now. So uh, the third runway will be completed on Tay's uh, watch. Now that odyssey of process of SeaTac's uh, third runway is symbolic. I think of the approach that we Americans uh, sometimes take about our transportation infrastructure. Yes, we recognize the importance of our roads and of our rails, of our uh, runways, and of our seaports, but acting on needed upgrades often takes a backseat to other concerns. And I remember uh, in the five and a half years that I served as Secretary of Transportation, I worked real hard to get one word into the State of the Union address. Failed. That one word was transportation. And one day I ran into the Deputy Secretary of Transportation, Mort Downey, uh, during uh, the eight years of the Clinton administration. He said, Norm, don't feel badly. We only got it once in during those eight years. So whatever the reason might be, whether it's budgetary, environmental, policy considerations about what mode of transportation or subject should take priority, it in effect means delays and frankly, increased cost when those projects are eventually constructed. And we uh, as a nation were tragically rem reminded of the danger of this approach just this last week uh, with the horrendous collapse of the Interstate 35W uh, bridge in Minnesota. The loss of life makes all the other issues pale by comparison. But that catastrophic failure of a piece of our federal interstate system has returned the state of our nation's infrastructure to the forefront of our public consciousness and the role that transportation plays in our economy. Now this focus presents an opportunity for the people, especially in this room, as people who care about your community, about the need to serve as evidenced by your commitment to Rotary. And we need leaders like you to contribute to the public debate that will take place, especially here in Seattle in the next several months about your transportation system. You're going to have the opportunity to vote on a roads and transit package that will enable your region to take a huge step forward toward ensuring greater mobility. Mobility and congestion really are the, are the sort of the uh, focal point today from a transportation perspective. And this new 50 miles of light rail and 186 new highway lane miles will represent a serious investment by the region about its own future. Now what is perhaps most impressive about where you are at uh, in this project called the sound transit system is that it represents a very serious turnaround of the agency overseeing your light rail system. When I first became the Secretary of Transportation, the Federal Transit Administration had completed its work on what's called the full funding agreement and gave it to me and I went through the whole thing with a number of people and I just didn't feel that it met the financial tests of a full funding agreement and I decided not to sign it. Now you can imagine what my conversation was like with Chairman Patty Murray, who was chairing the Transportation Appropriations Subcommittee. I mean, it was sort of like this. You know. <laughs> and I told uh, Senator Murray that I would not be able to sign 
the full funding agreement, but that our staff would be working with the Sound Transit Board and the people there. And uh, I met several times that year with Joni Earl, the then general manager, about how to turn it around. And uh, so uh, finally got to the point where it was signed. Now again, this morning as I came into SeaTac, I could see a rail line that represents about 75% of the completion of this project. And to me, it is a turnaround because um, this uh, schedule was adopted back in November 2001. And when that 14 mile um, MOS opens in less than two years, uh, it is on budget as it is today and uh, on schedule from a construction perspective. The fact is, since our earliest days, transportation has been synonymous with freedom and prosperity in America. And all the great moments that have taken place were as a result of vision and leadership, not from one person, but many. Unfortunately, as the 21st century appeared on the horizon, all the rewards that once came from our industry soon fell victim to gridlock and despair. Now, if you have a business that depends upon the delivery of goods, either domestically or from abroad, you know what the rail pipeline and port loading docks look like during the peak shipping season in the fall. They're completely clogged. And even though our ports and railroads have invested billions of dollars for infrastructure, they have no place to go when those heavy periods come about. They reach a point where they just can't get goods through, whether to locations in the state of Washington or rail shipping to places like Chicago. And unless you can afford or offload containers in Seattle and Tacoma and then get them onto trains running across the country, they're in for some serious problems. It's the same for the roads. As I prepared for a speech in Chicago uh, last week, I looked to the U.S.-Canadian border where delays on Detroit's Ambassador Bridge cost motor carriers between 150 and $200 million each year. Yes, America's businesses are spending a great deal of time in the slow lane these days, and it is costing millions. Now, if you factor in schedule changes, buffer time requirements, substitute deliveries, and lost customers, the costs are even greater. And of course, productivity takes a great deal of this brunt. And all of this comes about despite a 240% increase in federal transportation system, uh, in the federal transportation spending over the last 25 years. Now, I had some folks uh, crunch some additional numbers for me, and this is what they found. Nationally, congestion costs our economy over $200 billion a year. It adds 3.7 billion hours of travel a year and it wastes over 2.3 billion gallons of fuel. Now, no region of America, especially Washington State, where your workers assemble the world's airplanes to keep commerce moving through the skies, can we afford the, the luxury, I guess you might say, to be complacent about this worsening problem? We all know that solving our transportation problems is going to require fresh thinking, innovation, and creativity. And these are the same ingredients 
that have made this region's most successful companies, Microsoft, Boeing, Starbucks, Costco, just to name a few, what they are today. The choice is before you. Stay the course of prosperity or kiss it all goodbye because your shipment is stuck somewhere on I-5, I-405, SR-520 bridge, or the viaduct. Now, we expect water every time we turn on our faucets and electricity every time we switch on our lights. So then, is it too much to expect vehicles to be able to move safely and at the posted speed along our highways. So what is the solution? Well, remember that vision and leadership that I mentioned just a few minutes ago. We're going to need a lot of both in the years ahead, and that's where I trust people like you will be making a crucial uh, addition to the debate. As the nation's eyes and its editorial pages turn to focus on transportation, you should ask yourself and your elected officials, what are you going to do to meet the challenges of the future? If anything, it should be at least this. Stay involved. Continue to be a loud voice in that policy debate. With reauthorization of the aviation program and the surface transportation program in the Congress right now, there are opportunities to create new transportation modes that encourages bold and innovative approaches. What that model looks like won't be up to me, at least not anymore, but it will be to all of you. I probably don't need to tell you, given your perch on the leading edge of our continent's place on the Pacific Rim, but China presents an example of a commitment to boosting their economy through transportation investment and in preparation for the Beijing Olympics which will open on August 7, 2008. I remember visiting, as I did every year, but I remember the, the significant year of 2004, and I was meeting with the Minister of Railroads. And in that one year alone, China took delivery of 700 locomotives, of uh, 2,500 passenger cars, and 27,000 freight cars. Now, that is a five-year supply for our Class I railroads in the United States. And they're expanding their rail system. And I asked about those locomotives, and they said, well, of the 700, 500 would be coming from the United States, 350 from General, Motor, uh, General Electric, 150 from General Motors. And I said, why is it so heavily weighted on the GE side. And they said, well, because they make a low air breathing, high altitude locomotive for Peru and Chile, and we want to build the railroad through Tibet to the European marketplace. Now they are building hundreds and hundreds of miles of highways, railroads, and boosting their infrastructure but their network still has a long way to go. Now, while we still have a huge advantage, we can't afford to sit on our hands for the next 10, 15, or 20 years. So let me leave you with this. There may have been a time when America could afford to let things slide, a time when second best would do. But if there ever was such a time, it has long since passed. Today, only our best will be good enough. What we seek to achieve 
is nothing less than the revival of the independence, the prosperity, and the freedom that transportation once brought us so many years ago. And I am confident that you can do it. I am convinced that we are on the verge of the most significant reform in transportation since President Eisenhower initiated the interstate highway system a little more than 50 years ago. We can make transportation today a model for generations to come. This is our trust, and that's why we're here. You are advocates, locally and nationally. And if safe and improved infrastructure matters to your business or to your quality of life, now is the time to increase your advocacy. Again, I want to thank um, Seattle Rotary Number 4, my uh, Northwest uh, colleagues at Hill and Knowlton for uh, helping arrange this invitation and for bringing us together today. God bless each and every one of you, and may God continue to bless the United States of America. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 We thank the Secretary Mineta for coming. We appreciate his words. Maybe they will help us cure some of the problems we have here in Seattle and transportation. Okay, let's see. Next week we have Susan Masica, Chief of Staff of the National Park Systems. She's going to visit Mount Rainier before she comes and talks to us. And also on the program is Tia Jackson, the new UW women's basketball coach. See you at the Westin. Seattle Rotary Online is made possible in part by a grant from Enterprise Seattle. For over 35 years, Enterprise Seattle has provided client-based economic development services to businesses throughout King County and its 39 cities. More information on Enterprise Seattle and how they help businesses grow and prosper can be found at www.enterpriseseattle.org. And by First Choice Health working with the Washington Health Information Collaborative to use technology to bring better health care to patients throughout the Pacific Northwest. First Choice Health.